Now, in introducing John Wood today, I'm going to use a series of numbers. Almost all of us here in the room know him as the founder of Room to Read, a Microsoft exec who saw the light and decided to get involved in philanthropy and um, educate people around the world. But this book that he's written now about Purpose Incorporated is his third book. It's also his third time speaking at the FCC. He's been here for each book he's written. This will, however, be one of the first books uh, to be in what's going to be an FCC library devoted to authors who come and speak at the club, or so I've just heard from Florence de Changy. And also, um, 18 is the number of years that Room to Read has been in existence. That's when John found it. And since then, there have been millions of books uh, dedicated to children around the world devoted to literacy. It started on a budget of $35,000. Um, but today, John Wood is really here to speak about combining philanthropy with good business sense, that they shouldn't actually be different, but something combined. So it's my pleasure to introduce John Wood. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. A little love. OK. Um, it's uh, absolutely great to be back. Um, Hong Kong has always played a very big role in Room to Read's growth. I'm very happy to have launched my first book, uh, which is titled Leaving Microsoft to Change the World, uh, here at the FCC in 2006. My second book, Creating Room to Read, um, we had an event here in 2011. Neither of those times was I actually married to my wonderful wife, Amy Powell, who's sitting here, nor was I a Hong Kong resident. And thankfully, in the intervening years, both those things have changed. Uh, got, we got married in 2014. We actually met through Room to Read, which I think is an advertisement for good karma uh, of philanthropy. And we decided we'd start our marriage with a bold adventure and uh, moved here uh, to Hong Kong in 2014. Uh, the only downside of living here is that once upon a time, um, Martin Coven and Swire gave us free rooms at the upper house. Um, and so I would spend 20 to 25 nights a year at the upper house free of charge as part of Swire's contribution to doing good for the world. And then when we moved here, we suddenly had to like take care of our own apartment. And uh, it was a much smaller apartment. Um, so that's the only downside of, of living uh, here in Hong Kong. We love the city. We've been here for almost four years now. And a number of you in this room have made us feel very, very welcome. And so to all those of you who have welcomed us into the Hong Kong community, into the FCC community, I um, just really want to say thank you. I want to leave as much time as possible for um, dialogue, not monologue. So I'm going to give you a, a, about a 15-minute summary of the book. The book is titled Purpose Incorporated, Turning Cause into Your Competitive Advantage. Um, the goal of having the title be Purpose Incorporated, this is a, uh, an, an intention to kind of double entendre. Because I believe that when businesses incorporate purpose into their DNA and incorporate purpose into their business model, they are much better businesses. Not just more sustainable, but actually more profitable with more motivated employees. I wrote this book because I wish this book had existed um, back when I was in graduate school. Um, I attended um, Kellogg, uh, the Kellogg Graduate School at Northwestern. I remember once upon a time asking a professor, I said, OK, so we're all going to make a lot of money. We're one of the top rated business schools in the world. We're all graduating. We're going to do well. We're going to make money. What, what's, what's the purpose? So can I, can I use my business career to be a force for good in the world? Can I use the profits that we generate to make the world a better place. And I was sternly admonished with a quote from Milton Friedman. Many of you may remember Milton Friedman's famous quote. I think it's actually a quote that's done a lot of damage for the world, where Friedman said, there is no social purpose of business other than returning maximum profits to shareholders. If you think about that today, imagine if Milton Friedman was trying to hire millennials in this day and age. I wrote it, write a cheeky scene in the book where we do a little fake interview between Milton Friedman and a superstar millennial young woman, and he can't land the deal. Because 80% of millennials asked during their first interview, is this company part of the problem, or is this company part of the solution? I interviewed Edith Cooper, the global head of talent for Goldman Sachs, a longtime Room to Read partner for the book. And she just gotten off a plane. She was at Duke interviewing undergraduates. And she said, these undergraduates aren't just asking about the giant vampire squid quote in Rolling Stone. They're asking, what is our position on global warming? What is our position on fracking? Can we drill down in the composition of your board and why there are not more women or more women, more people of color on your board? She said, these students are asking about this because they care. They want to know if they're working for a company that's part of the solution rather than part of the problem. 
So my own belief, and this is partly driven by all the amazing partnerships Room to Read has, has um, done with businesses, that purpose can be a way that a, you can build a better company. I talk in the book about basically all the different ways purpose can be something that if you bake it into your DNA, you have a stronger company. So number one is building a bond with your customers. Customers want to know they're doing business with a company that's ethical. They want to know that they are doing business with a company that cares about the world. I profile one of my favorite startups, a skincare company called Tatcha. Tatcha is headquartered in San Francisco. It is a startup. And being a startup as a beauty brand is tough because you're up against the Estee Lauders and the L'Oreal's and the comp these companies that have billion dollar marketing budgets and Oscar parties and six, sp six page spreads in Vogue. And here's little Tatcha, this unknown skincare startup. Vicky and Brad, the co-founders, Vicky's ex Starbucks, they're both Harvard Business School alums, in the very beginning came to Room to Read and said, we want to be able to tie a social outcome to each and every purchase of our products. So the customer feels good, not just about their skin, but they feel good about what they're doing for the world. So they baked into their business model. This was not a one-off promotion. This is not the month of November. We're going to give 1% of our profits. This was every SKU, every product, every um, channel would donate money to put one girl in school for one day, dollar a day. So basically every product gives a girl a chance. And they called it Beautiful Faces, Beautiful Futures. And the idea behind it was very simple. The customers would connect. Last year on International Women's Day, and that, that sounds very small, one, one dollar per product, one girl, one day. But last year on International Women's Day, they announced they had funded their one millionth girl day. And by the end of this year, they're going to have done 1.5 million girl days of education. So that's what one startup did. So Vicky said, number one, our customers love this. They feel good about themselves. Number two, we're recruiting in a white hot market of San Francisco competing against the big tech giants. This helps us to find people, especially female employees, who are motivated saying, I'm going to come to work to a company knowing that every product we sell has not just a ka-ching attached to it, but has a social, social outcome. And then they look really great on social media. Their um, performance scores on social media are off the charts in terms of the earned media they're getting as people are talking about them. So I talk a lot about that. How do you build a bond with your customers if your customer knows? And I'm kind of obsessed with this. I looked at Ethos Water, the first water company to ever declare they would give 50% of their net profit to water projects in the developing world. The company, a little known startup, said this is a defensible competitive advantage for us. Because if the Nestle's or the Danone's or the Coca-Cola's of the world declared they were going to give 50% of their water profits to clean water projects in the developing world, they'd either be fired by their board, sued by their shareholders, or both. Because they're stuck in this ancient model of maximize every dollar of profitability or else you're not a good capitalist. So Ethos said 50% of net profits go to clean water projects. They caught the eye of um, Pierre Omidyar, the eBay founder, at a TED conference where Ethos had been the official water. They got a land at a meeting with Howard Schultz, and then Starbucks acquired Ethos and kept the model of a, a certain percentage of profits going to clean water projects, but immediately these two entrepreneurs, Jonathan and Peter, who founded it, now had their product in 100,000 outlets around the world, every entrepreneur's dream. So bonding with customers, I think, is one really good reason to look at purpose. A second is social media. We know that you only look as good on social media as you deserve to look, that it's an ultimately very transparent platform. And we see so many companies, if you've never seen WestJet, the Canadian upstart airline, every year WestJet does something where they tell their employees to go out and create what they call Christmas miracles. And the idea is they democratize doing good throughout the entire airline. And employees are charged with going out and doing something good for their community, for the world, at Christmas. The first WestJet Christmas Miracle video, if you've not seen it, definitely go go online and just type in WestJet Christmas Miracle. There's now four different videos. Over 50 million views on YouTube. And think about that, what you'd have to pay to actually get 50 million impressions if you were paying for it. These are all earned impressions. These are um, company people tweeting it out, putting it on Facebook or Instagram because they like what the company stands for. Likewise, companies can look really bad on social media because it's a very transparent platform. So for example, if you remember the Pepsi Co. with the Kendall Jenner ad, um, this was a thing where Pepsi tried to co-opt the Black Lives Matter movement by having this famous supermodel pretending that giving a can of Pepsi to a police officer would diffuse all racial tensions at a protest. And of course, it was one of the most panned ads in the history of social media because Pepsi wasn't actually building this into their DNA. To their credit, they did admit that it was a mistake. They took it down and they apologized. But this is a classic case of what we talk about in the book, which is that you have to mean it. 
if your company is talking about doing good for the world, it can't be a cynical one-off exercise. It has to be really um, owned, uh, both in the heart and in the head throughout the company. I talk a lot in the book about winning the war for talent and how purpose can help you do that. I mentioned, of course, that millennials do ask in their interviews, is this company part of the solution or is it part of the problem? But it's not just millennials. The world today is full of literally millions of what I refer to as mid-career switchers. There are people who have hit the age of 35 or 40 or 45 or 50. They've been, they've been successful. They're way too young to retire. But they walk into work every day thinking, is this it? Is this all there is? I'm just going to keep doing this until I'm 65 or 70? And so there's a whole group of people out there right now who are looking for second or third careers, but they want them to be purpose-driven. I outline a guy in the book, Scott Ullum, um, a close friend of mine who had been a Goldman banker, and then he'd been the CFO of a plastics company in Wisconsin. And one day he got a call from a recruiter. And the recruiter said, hey, I want you to go out to Orange County, California. Edwards Life Sciences is looking for a CFO. And Scott said, I need to move again like I need a hole in my head. My wife would kill me if I said we're going to move our three kids again for the second time in five years. And the recruiter said, it's January. It's Orange County. Go. Get some sun. Enjoy it. So he left Wisconsin, went out, and interviewed with um, Mike Musselum, the 18-year CEO of Edwards Life Sciences. Edwards is the largest manufacturer of heart valves in the world. So it's a very purpose-driven business. It's also very profitable. If you go to your Bloomberg terminal and check out Edwards' stock price over Mike's 18-year um, tenure as CEO, it's an extremely successful business. But at its heart, literally at its heart, it's very purpose-driven. So Scott asked Mike all the questions a CFO would ask a CEO, and Mike asked all the questions back. But at the end, Scott said, Mike, tell me what's the best part of working here? And Mike said, oh, that's easy. So those, those are the patient reunions. Patient reunions, what are those? So Mike said, well, a lot of times our receptionist will come to work, 8.30 in the morning, she's unlocking the front door, and there'll be a couple standing there in their 70s and their 80s. May I help you, sir? May I help you, ma'am? And the man will say, yes, I have, I have one of your devices in here. May I meet the team that made it? And this happens often enough, there's a standard operating procedure that involves getting his social security number, putting out a call to the factory floor. Most of these devices, because they're hand-sewn, um, have to be very, very delicate. And most of the people sewing them are women with very delicate hands, quite often first-generation immigrants from Indonesia, from the Philippines. That call goes out to the shop floor, to the manufacturing floor. Grace, your patient is here. Would you like to meet him? She comes out, and there are hugs, and there are tears, and there are selfies, and they're now in each other's Christmas card list. And this happens all the time. And Scott was hearing this story, and he starts crying, and then Mike starts crying. He's like, oh, I've got to tell my wife we're moving. So he, he moved. And here's a classic case of a guy who's in his late 40s. He could have done anything, but he chose. And that was one way, I think, that a company like Edwards proves that you can use purpose not just for recruiting, but also motivation and retention. And we see it all the time at Room to Read. If companies 15 years ago might have written us a check, and it was done from a CSR department, and it was more of a one-off, we now have more and more companies who are saying, how can I get my employees involved? Can we do a site visit? Can we go to a library opening? Surveys show that the number one factor that helps companies retain their superstars is feeling a sense of connection to something bigger than just the bottom line. The number two factor is not even close. If you want to retain your superstars in business today, you have to connect them to something that's bigger than just typical EPS, uh, profits, whatever it might be. So I've outlined a number of companies in the book that actually use that to say, how can we not only do good for the world, but how can we use that to motivate our employees and retain our best people? I talk in the book about using purpose to unify your supply chain. I profile a really interesting character named Easy Vidra. Um, actually, Ezekiel is his first name, is Israeli. Um, but he often says, just call me Easy. I'm Easy like Sunday morning. And Easy's job was to open Google's first campus in London. The idea behind Google Campus was to have a place like the FCC, let's say, but for geeks who could all be in the startup scene in tech, but there was a place they could all connect, and Google would then be able to actually meet all these promising startups. So it's free Wi-Fi, free coffee. Come on in. We've got a huge place in Shoreditch. You can be a startup and connect with each other. But what he found after a year was that most of the startups were not connecting with Google. They were somewhat suspicious. Are you going to steal my IP? Are you going to steal my employees? And he said, I just didn't see anything happening where I could say there's a really good return on our investment here, because you've got a bunch of people who are already somewhat introverted, who are just coming here and staring at their, la their laptop screens all day. So he approached us and said, I've got an idea. I want to do something called Tech Bikers. And the idea behind Tech Bikers was put down your laptop, pick up your bike. 
basically a charity ride where they would leave London on Friday night, go to Paris, have a nice dinner, wake up the next morning and start pedaling north back to London as a charity ride. He put it up uh, just on a, a Facebook post. It was oversubscribed within a month. They've now done this for five years in a row. They brought over 400 different startups together who wouldn't talk to each other and wouldn't talk to Google. But once it was a neutral playing ground of saying, let's raise money for literacy, let's get healthy, let's get fit, let's meet each other. And they now have expanded. It is all volunteer driven. But they've now done a Budapest. Actually, last week, they did their first, uh, their, sorry, their second um, Budapest to Vienna ride is expanded to Australia, to the United States. And that was just one little way that a company said we can use purpose as a way to unite our supply chain. Um, I'm going to wrap this up in about four minutes, Tara, if that's okay. Is still okay on time? You're great on time. Great, okay. Um, and I will say that I write this book really as a capitalist to fellow capitalists. I could have written this, heart, this book as a bleeding heart liberal, because I am kind of a bleeding heart liberal. But a friend of mine who's a CEO of a major French company said to me, if you just write a book that lectures me and tells me my company needs to be doing good for the world, I'm not going to read your damn book. There's enough people out there lecturing me. He said, I want to know who's done it, who's gone before me, what examples are out there, what can inspire me. So about 80% of this book are examples of companies that are doing this. How does Goldman use it? How does Credit Suisse use it? How does BNP Paribas and Citibank use it? How do unknown startups use it? How do tech companies use purpose as a way to basically bake it in their DNA and use it as a competitive advantage. But at the end of the book, I pivot. And I say, I'm not going to talk as a capitalist. The last thing I'm going to talk about in the book is very simple. It's Y-O-U. It's you. Why should you as a business person, why should any executive embrace purpose? And the reality is that I think there are so many reasons on a personal level to do this. You have a voice. You get a vote. I believe all of us were put, in, were put in this earth to do more than just make money. And I believe our companies were put in this earth to do more than just make money. Yes, they will make money. Capitalists are good at that. But when you look back on your life, the question is, what legacy are you going to leave? What do you want to say at the end of your career? No tombstone has ever said she cranked out 21 consecutive quarters of increasing earnings per share. Um, what we think about at the end of our life is our legacy and did our career stand for something. We know that purpose not just has an effect on business, it has an effect on our lives. People who report having a sense of purpose in their lives and careers have lower rates of Alzheimer's. They have lower rates of dementia. People who have purpose in their lives in Japan, they interviewed Japanese men. And even if that guy's purpose was something simple like keeping the local park cleaned up or delivering food to a shut-in, men in Japan who reported a sense of purpose in their lives lived on average eight to 10 years longer than those who don't. It's a way to bond across generations. Scott Olam from Edwards told me when he worked in a plastics company, his teenage daughter never asked him, Daddy, Daddy, what did you do at the office today? He said, all of a sudden, my teenage daughter thinks I'm cool because I'm talking about these patient reunions and bringing my kids in to meet people whose lives have been saved. So I make a case in the end of the book that you should do it because it creates a better business. Um, I also think you should do it, we should all do it because it creates a better life that we wake up in the morning knowing that we're part of a solution and we go to work with a spring in our step or a smile on our face because we realize that our business success is also helping to make the world a better place. So the last thing I'll say is that I've, I'm walking the walk on this. Um, the first two books I did through HarperCollins and through Penguin. Um, and you all sometimes, some of you may lament that journalism is not a great way to make money. Another great way to not make money is through traditional publishing. Uh, the publishers don't really um, uh, have a very good business model. And if I, every copy that was sold of leaving Microsoft to change the world, I think yielded something less than a dollar uh, of actual royalties to the author. So I've done something different with this book, and I've actually self-published it. Um, God bless Invest HK. I got my company set up in less than 24 hours online. Um, so I've got an HK-based company now that um, um, is called Purpose Incorporated. We've self-published the book with a really great publisher here in Hong Kong. And we're, when we sell the book, I'm donating all of my author profits to Room to Read. And you can actually, if you're smart about doing a book tour, and you can fly on donated frequent flyer miles, and you can stay at Rosewood Hotels, courtesy of Sonia Chang and her team, and keep your costs down, you can actually maximize the amount of royalties that go to the cause. So my goal for Purpose Incorporated is to raise enough um, money through the book profits to fund 25 new libraries. Um, Tara mentioned we've already, with the support of many in this room, we've opened over 20,000 libraries life to date um, across 15 countries. 
Uh, we've reached 12.4 million students. We actually are 8x Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie, in his lifetime, did 2,500 libraries in Great Britain and the US. Um, we're now at 8x that, but it's not nearly enough. There's still hundreds of millions of people out there who cannot read or write. And if you haven't seen Bhakti's piece in last Friday's SCMP, she did a fantastic update of where Room to Read has come from our humble beginnings. But even at 20,000 libraries, we're not satisfied. 25 libraries may seem small in comparison to that, but 25 libraries will serve 10,000 students. We've got a great partnership with Bookazine. The book is in every single Bookazine, and they're donating their profits, and I'm donating my profits to build a Bookazine library in India. And ultimately, my goal for the book is not just to create a movement of capitalists embracing purpose and using this book as their permission slip to not feel guilty about talking at this at meetings, but also ultimately that we'll have at least 10,000 students in India and Vietnam who will have new libraries uh, opened with, uh, with the pro profits from the book. So it is for sale here. I do hope I, I won't go into heavy sell mode, but I will mention that it's for sale here today. Uh, 188 Hong Kong dollars with all profits going to uh, build libraries. So I'm happy to um, cut myself off there exactly four minutes before schedule and move to, uh, to Q&A. Again, thank you all for being here and thanks for your uh, continued friendship from so many of you in this room. And if you're new to Room to Read, I do hope you'll check out roomtoread.org and get involved with us because we got a long way ahead, a lot more to accomplish. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> so I stand. Which are you I'll stand, I'll stand. John, thank you very much. So uh, I'd love to open it up for Q&A, but first, if I may, I mean, you're obviously a very energetic guy, driven, devoted to what you do, and you're, it makes good sense why someone would want to do good and change their lives, but surely there's some challenges associated with it. Mm -hmm. What is the hardest thing in making that type of change that you've experienced as well? For me, for me personally, or in terms of towards more, moving towards a more purpose-driven business? M moving towards a more purpose-driven business. I think, I think the biggest challenge is that there's still a lot of people stuck in that old mode, old mode of thinking that business is all about making profits and if you want to do good for the world, you rely on NGOs and you rely on the government. Um, still too many people, I think, who've subscribed to the Milton Friedman adage that capitalism is all about maximizing profitability, full stop, end of conversation. Uh, I think the older a business leader is, the more likely they're to be stuck in that, in that mindset, whereas younger business leaders, I think, completely get it. Um, but I think the biggest challenge is quite often in a meeting, if someone brings up a purpose-driven initiative or a purpose-driven idea, there's five people on the sidelines with their heat-seeking missiles ready to shoot down that trial balloon of saying, ah, we can't do that, or no, nah, we don't have money for it. And I talk in the book about the fact that purpose does not actually even have to cost money. I profile Goldman Sachs, which has a wonderful program called GS Gives. Um, Goldman, GS Gives is a program under which every partner has 10% of their annual compensation ring-fenced into a donor-advised fund. So they have to give it away. They have no choice, they have to give it away. And this is something that Lloyd Blankfein initiated after the global financial crisis to say, we need to be sh showing that we can be a force for good in the world. And 10% of, of Goldman's total compensation is a lot of money. Well, what was happening is the 400 plus partners were actually writing checks to their favorite causes every year. And then one day one of the partners said, well, hang on, all of our millennials our analysts, we have tens of thousands of, of young people we're trying to recruit. They want to be a force for good in the world, so let's democratize this. And what happened then is a bunch of partners started something called the Goldman Analyst Impact Challenge. And any analyst at Goldman, these are usually 23, 24, a couple years out of school, could put together a pitch team and come pitch. Gold medal, $100,000. Silver, $50,000. Bronze, $25,000. And when these pitch teams came in, they were all self-organized. Lloyd himself was in the room to show that he valued this and cared about it. The employees were super motivated. They learned some new skills along the way of pitching and, and things like that. But most importantly, it was super motivated. You think about the fact that when I was 23 years old, if I was given a chance to give $100,000 to a cause I would have believed in, I would thought to myself, that's more money than I'll give away in my lifetime. So this is one way that on zero incremental dollars, they just said, let's not, we don't need to spend extra money, we just need to be smarter about how we spend it. And rather than the partner giving the money away based on what he and his wife or husband choose, let's actually say all the employees have a say. So I think getting to the point where it's embraced at the senior level, there is a permission slip, which I hope this bank is a, or this book is a permission slip for companies to think about it. And then when people shoot up that heat seeking missile, just don't don't give up on it. Um, don't let the naysayers have the day. We have microphones around the room, so if you want to raise your hand, let us know what organization you're from and your name. 
Who, who'd like to go first? Karen. Hi, thank you, John. My name's Karen Ko. I'm a freelance journalist. But I'm asking this question uh, with my NGO hat on because I sit on the board of directors of an NGO which uh, does controversial work, um, women's sexual and reproductive health, mostly in Africa. And among the range of services that we support is, is the right to abortion where it's legal. So we're always struggling with um, donors because there are some donors who will, would love to fund all the other things we do, but because we support abortion, they say, don't want to touch it. What, what advice would you give to NGOs that do deal with these kinds of topics that, where there's a huge need, but because of religious, political views, etc., uh, donors shy away? How do we tell that story you know, in, a, in a way that that makes it more appealing, especially for unrestricted funds? Mm -hmm. I think, first of all, and you, and you may have already done this, so forgive me, I don't know the details. So if I say something that's inaccurate or obvious, um, forgive me, but I would try to ring fence everything you can that's not controversial into a bucket and say, well, you can fund this bucket over here for some of the things we do that maybe aren't as um, controversial. Secondly, is I would try to really figure out the companies out there, um, like Tatcha, um, as one example, where the majority of their clientele are women who probably care more about this issue than men do, although I will say as a man, I do care about the issue. Uh, I'm a feminist, so it's not, I wouldn't want to tar all men, but I would probably try to find companies that are, um, have much more of a female demographic. I probably would go more towards the startups than the big, you know, the bigger companies where you have a lot of people whose only job is to say no. Um, and I think really entrepreneurs are probably where I would start with that because you don't have when you're an entrepreneur you don't have a you don't have a committee you don't have a risk committee you don't have a philanthropy committee Vicky Sai at Tatcha said to me this is great because if you told me once a year I had to sit down and allocate my charitable allocation I'd never have find the time to do it I'd be gobsmacked I'd be like oh there's so many causes she goes this way it's just built into the DNA and so I would try to figure out like for you what does it cost if you think about your the women you serve whether you call them your clients or whatever you call them the women you serve what does it cost to serve one woman for one procedure or one woman for one day and then basically say so you can kind of productize that and say you know for five Hong Kong dollars per day a woman in Tanzania can have et cetera et cetera et cetera whatever yeah but I would I would probably um, and also those who say no don't get frustrated because there's tens of thousands of companies out there so even if you know a hundred say no to you I would just just keep plugging away I would remember that my my first year budget was thirty five thousand um, dollars but then we just kept plugging away. Thanks. Over here. Uh, thank you very much. My name is John Antweiler. I'm also a Kellogg alumni. Um, I enjoyed your talk very much. I, I have a question uh, as you, uh, with your organization, how do you get through many of the governments uh, in the region. I mean, the governments will naturally look at this, I, I'm expecting, as an American organization, as an organization pro um, maybe proposing American values as something that might not be religiously right in a particular country. Yeah. Um, so how do, you, how do you address those things? Well, first of all, um, we don't view ourselves as an American NGO. We happen to be headquartered in San Francisco, but 90% of our employees are local national. They're close to the customer. So there are Cambodians in Cambodia, there are Tanzanians in Tanzania, there are Indians in India. Uh, we don't have a lot of expats driving around in Land Rovers telling the local people what to do. So when there's a meeting happening in Cambodia with the Ministry of Education, it is the conversation is held in Khmer, and it's all Cambodians in the room. Now we still have the same logo, but that logo basically says room to read Cambodia. Secondly, is we assure the governments we're there for good reasons. We're not there to propagandize. Um, we don't view, we view ourselves as non, you know, non-denominational. We're not preaching any values. We're not waving any flags. More than half our funding comes from outside the United States. So, you know, if a donor happens to be Swiss and they want to mention to the, you know, local village they adopted that they're a Swiss company or a Swiss family, that's fine. They can do that, but they can't do it in a way that proselytizes any values. Third, we work with the ministries to say we're not going to try. We're not trying to create a parallel system. 
we are working within the system to improve what exists. So we're not trying to create a chain of private schools. Uh, we are working within the ministry to say, let's work in the government schools to make them better, to make sure the teachers are trained, that the libraries are bright and shiny and open air and full of books and there's a checkout system, et cetera. And then fourth, we require um, the ministry and we require the local community to co-invest in each and every project. So we want to know that the ministries are motivated. We often say we can't want it more than you want it. So if the ministry is not willing to co-invest, we will not do the project. If the local community is not willing to put sweat equity and labor into the project, we won't co-invest. We ask parents to put as little as 10 rupees into a bucket that acquires additional books for the library. Now, the majority of the books are still provided by us, but just that little ceremonial thing of families giving 10 rupees. And Amy and I were in a school in Sri Lanka about five years ago, and it was absolutely brilliant because we walked in at the um, beginning of the school day, and all the kids were wrapping up their little farmer's market. What had happened is the headmistress of this school, which is grades one through five, convinced every single family to send their kids to school with whatever product they had on their land, mangoes, coconuts, bananas, whatever it might be. And they ran a little farmer's market, and then the money from that farmer's market went into the library maintenance fund. And I said, how much money did you make? And the headmistress said, we don't know. And I said, why don't you know? She goes, Monday morning, fifth grade math class, they count the money. Kids show up early that day, they're excited, little junior capitalists who are running this little farmer's market. And I said, what will the money be used for? And the headmistress paint, pointed to the walls and said, all four of the inside walls are painted, only two of the outside walls are painted. This money will be used to buy paint. And we're asking the parents to donate labor. So Amy and I, doing due diligence, we looked, went to the parents and said, are you, are you donating labor? Yes. Are you? Yes. Are you? No. I said to the guy, no? Why? And he goes, because I have money, and I bought 100 pounds of cement. So this is what we're trying to do to say we're not outsiders coming in. It's local control, local co-ownership, local co-investment. I'll say, say finally one last thing. This also works really well as an anti-corruption device because we tell the government ministers, you can't ask us for money because we're going to be asking you for money. It, and, it, and it works. If it doesn't work, we walk away because there's still thousands of villages that want us. Yes, in the back. Um, my name is Giorgio Biancoroso. I'm an associate member here and I teach at HKU, the, the university nearby. Um, I'm speaking at HKU tonight. Oh, great. Uh, I don't remember the context, uh, the precise context of Milton Friedman's uh, statement, but to his credit, I think he was just trying to be accurate. You know, he wasn't expressing a wish or, you know, or, or a desire that capitalism be the way it was or it is. Uh, but, you know, that aside, he belonged to a generation which also saw uh, the GI Bill, and of course the, the creation of a significant uh, web of support in the United States, as elsewhere, of course, in Europe particularly. So you make much of the difference between the old generation capitalists and the new generations, but I'm wondering whether millennials are so keen on companies doing good because the state is no longer there. Uh, we're seeing the UK welfare system actually crumbling by the day. So do you see a correlation there, first of all? Yeah, and, second, and second, do you do work in the United States? Because I think there are issues in the US as well. So I was curious about that. Yeah, so what was the f give me the first question again, because I can't handle two questions in my puny um, little brain at the sorry same time. Sorry about that. Uh, the first question is whether. Just briefly. It's re there is a correlation. The correlation, yeah, OK. Between yes. you know, old yes. generation yes. and new generation values. V very definitely. I think that this generation has an expectation that business will be a force for good in the world. And if you look at, you know, people make fun of millennials for being obsessed with their phones. Um, but a lot of what they're doing in their phones is looking up companies, trying to figure out, is this company a force for good or is this company just merely going to perpetuate the status quo? And in their consumer decisions, what they, what they buy, who they uh, patronize, the companies they join, the companies they possibly quit. Um, these are real issues because a lot of millennials have basically realized that government may not be able to solve every problem. Governments probably cannot solve every problem. I would argue that public-private partnerships are a good way to do it. Um, like SCMP had an article yesterday about in mainland China, the government paying businesses to turn their toilets from patrons only to public toilets, and then the government pays the business owner a stipend. That's, I think, a wonderful example of where the government can work with the private sector to c collectively together um, solve problems. And then the second question, 
Oh, but the United States. Sorry. While we're at it, well, not, not, no, not, no. Let me counter. No, no, no. Let me, let me, well, okay. let me, let me, let me. This is not yeah. a debating society. Yeah, yeah, so sure. let's just, and we only have a couple minutes left. So the United States, no, our model has always been one of raising money in the rich world and deploying it in the poorest parts of the world. Part of the reason for that is that if you look at what it costs to keep a girl in school for a year in our scholarship program in Tanzania or Cambodia, it's three hundred dollars per girl per year. If you wanted to help a kid in New York go to private school, it's 50 to 100 times that. So our argument is that a very small amount of money can go a very long way. And these are in countries with like almost no social safety net. We're talking about post-Civil War Sri Lanka, post-Khmer Rouge Cambodia, post-apartheid South Africa. I would not argue that there are not problems in the United States, but I would argue that every charity has to be very clear. What does it stand for? What is its model of change? And don't get themselves spread too thin. You gotta focus like a laser beam on the one problem you're trying to solve, and our problem is very simple. Education for the poorest of the poor in the world's 50 poorest countries, and for God's sake, don't forget the girls and women. We have time for one more question. Hi, John. thank you very much. My name's Nicole, and I run Next Chapter Ventures, which is both a crowdfunding platform and an access to capital platform for female entrepreneurs, particularly startups. And what I find is most of our startups have a business with impact, which is what we call it. I'm quite inspired by what you've said because, you know, we see this a lot in terms of the women starting businesses is that they want something more with that. But they want to be profitable. But we have um, first an issue that women don't access capital in the same way, which is what we're trying to fix. But then secondly, they're talking to investors around a business that isn't just revenue driven, but it's obviously got <laughs> a purpose there. So would you have any advice for how these founders can be talking to investors around not only what is the scalability of their business, what's their metrics, what their growth, you know, all of that great stuff, but yeah. really what they're also trying to do and how do they balance that conversation so they don't immediately be deemed a charity, which we hear all the time. <laughs> and it's quite annoying because they've actually got some amazing ideas and great passion and, and, uh, and potential. So. No, I'm really glad you brought that up because I, I, did, I didn't have enough time, but I actually wrote a, um, a chapter in the book about how purpose can help you to find the right investors. And there's a generation today that wants to find a fair return on their capital, not necessarily a maximum return on their capital. So if you look at things like Justin Rockefeller, what he's doing at, the, at Impact, where they're working with next generation, you know, the next generation is going to inherit between 30 and 60 trillion dollars in the next two decades. Uh, and more money will be inherited by women than by men. What that means, as you have a younger generation, you have a more socially conscious, is a lot of people out there are saying, I want to invest in a business that gives me a fair return, but I don't necessarily need to have a maximum ROI. So if, if you get an extra couple dollars of profit by poisoning the earth, don't do it. Like, let's just look for a fair return on our capital. And so I think that what, with, what's neat about that is if you have an investor Right. Having an investor is like going on a long road trip. You're going to be together for a long time. You don't want a road trip with someone who's a buzzkill. And if the investor only cares about grinding out every single dollar of profit and every single point behind the decimal of why can't we do more, why can't we do more, greed is not good. If all your investor cares about is maximum ROI, they'll never be happy. If, however, your investor cares about social outcomes, they will. And I profile in the book Atlassian. Um, the Australian software startup that IPO'd a couple of years ago, uh, making billionaires of Mike and Scott, the two young co-founders. But Mike and Scott, from the very beginning, told their board, we are building into the model what we call Pledge 1%, where 1% of equity um, goes into a foundation, so the money gets given away. 1% of our licenses are given to good causes. 1% of our employees' time can be used to donate. Similar model to Salesforce. And in that sense, in that case, they told their investors, this is non-negotiable. When Axel came in with the biggest investment Axel as a VC had ever made, $60 million, Scott and Mike said, by the way, this is sacrosanct. We're not changing our model. And it's awesome that that horn is sounding because that means I'm done. I'm not sure if that's coincidental or not, but I'm happy to talk more. And please do get the book. It makes a great gift for your potential uh, entrepreneurs. It would be great. And again, I'm just going to point out all profits do go to help kids in places like India and Vietnam and Cambodia get libraries. So I do hope you'll enjoy the book. Thank you. John, thank you very much. I've never heard that horn before, but it has gone to a clock. Um, thank you very much for not only the motivation, but also the great nuts and bolts advice. Um, and as always, from the FCC, a small gift. Thank you very much for joining us. And have a great afternoon, everyone.